All right, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you don't have them, don't worry, we'll have it on the, on the screen. But also, if you didn't get your communion packet uh, when you walked in, would you raise your hand and uh, go ahead and, uh, and grab those now? The ushers will make sure that you get one because uh, today, uh, this entire message is like a communion thought, okay? So we're going to lead our, work our way through this text, and uh, we're going to take communion like we normally do at the end, but um, we're going to do it just a little bit differently today. So I want you to have those uh, communion packets in your hand ready uh, to go. In chapter 11, Paul turns his attention to the worship gathering and the whole head-covering topic that uh, James whined about preaching last week, because I listened, I heard. You didn't have to talk about sex for seven weeks, okay? <laughs> Give me a break, man. No, I did a great job. But that was all about not being a stumbling block to new folks who would show up at the gathering. And if they would come and they would see uh, females who didn't have their head covering, it would just be um, atrocious to them because it was, it was sexually provocative in that culture, and so again, as we've talked about, like Paul's mission and Paul's posture is I'll do whatever it takes to win people for the gospel. I don't want to be a stumbling block. So if we need to cover our heads, let's cover our heads. So that's kind of what he was talking about in that. And then in verse 17, he begins to address another controversial issue regarding the worship gathering. It is rich people are segregating from poor people and they are getting drunk on the wine at the Lord's Supper. I mean, this, this church is an absolute mess. That's why we only give you this much, right? <laughs> we, don't, we, we want to avoid that at all costs. But this church is just a mess. You know, and and Paul, Paul doesn't, um, he doesn't count them out. He calls them out and then calls them up to live out their new and true identity as redeemed children uh, of God. And throughout this letter, if you've noticed, he, he continues to refer to them as brother and sister, brothers and sisters. Like you're part of the family. We're all part of the same family. He's going to do that uh, again in this section. So let's dive in uh, to that. He says, now in giving this instruction, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. He's like, your gatherings aren't accomplishing anything good. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. Back in the very first part of this letter, he's calling out division. They were divided over certain preachers and certain teachers. And now they're divided over class. He says, when you come together then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It's what it's supposed to be. But that's not what you're doing. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Now, there was no church building in the first uh, century church, right? They met in each other's homes. And oftentimes, it was the home of a wealthy person who had enough space to host the gathering. And the Lord's Supper was not this. It was an actual full-blown meal, uh, that they would come together, usually potluck style, so everybody, everybody would bring something to the meal to share. And so it was like a party in, the, in a sense, but when they partied in the Greco-Roman culture, the wealthy people sat in the best room in the house and ate the best food. The poor people were relegated to a different section of the house, and they ate what was left over if there was anything left over. And he says here, you, you humiliate those who have nothing you're dividing yourself over, over class. Uh, when my mom's uh, side of the family would gather together for Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, meals at my grandparents' house, uh, all of us kids, we, we ate at the kids' table in the laundry room. Anybody else eat at the kids' table growing up? That's right, in the laundry room. The little card tables and, you know, all the adults ate in the dining room table and they, they, they had real glasses, you know, we had plastic cups, they had real plates, we had paper plates. And that was because we were, we were high risk for breakage, they got that. And, but there was a clear division by age. And that's kind of what it was like in, in Corinth, that's what was going on here, but not by age, but by 
classes, like the rich people were sitting at the dining room, the poor people were in the laundry room eating the leftovers if there was anything left over. And Paul's issue here is, his his point is that, that this division has no place in the gathering. And this division has no place around the Lord's Supper because Jesus nailed that to the cross. There is no rich, there is no poor, there are only sinners saved by grace. And he says, you guys, you got homes to eat in. Like this is not a tailgate event. You, you can do that in your house. The main purpose here is, is when we take the Lord's Supper is not physical sustenance it's spiritual remembrance and you're not only missing the point of it you are making a mockery of it so I've got no praise for you in this matter he says I've got no praise for you but I do have instruction verse 23 he says for I received for from for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you so he's talked about this before on the night when he was betrayed Jesus The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup. And after supper, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, Paul is referencing the Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples on the night before he was crucified, which happened to be his last meal. Passover, and we've talked about this because Paul has hit this a few different times in this letter, if you've noticed that. Passover was a time to remember when God had delivered the Jews out of Egypt. They had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 plus years, and then God sends Moses in on Operation Exodus and to deliver the people across the Red Sea to freedom. And while Moses negotiates with Pharaoh, God rains down nine different plagues on the Egyptians, and none of them really get the attention. They, they don't really convince Pharaoh to let them go. Uh, but the tenth plague was the proverbial nail in the coffin. It was the plague of death over Uh, every firstborn son in Egypt. And God instructed Moses to have the Israelites slaughter a lamb and to take the blood and apply the blood to the doorposts, the door frames of their home, and then to roast the lamb and to eat the lamb, to share in a meal uh, together. We talked about this back in in chapter 5, that as long as they were at home under the blood... They were protected from God's wrath, from God's judgment. God would see the blood of the lamb, and he would pass over that house. And after God passed over Egypt, Pharaoh let the Israelites go, and Moses leads them across the Red Sea, and God establishes them officially as a new nation, as his people there at Mount Sinai. And he gives them the Ten Commandments that would serve as the framework for how they were to live out this idea of family together. And so every year, every Jewish family would gather together to remember and to retell the Passover story. And then they would share a meal together. And the meal was the same. They were the same elements for every family because the the elements of the meal helped drive home the point of the Passover story. They had bitter herbs that would remind them of the slavery of their ancestors in Egypt. They would eat unleavened bread that remind them of how quickly their ancestors had to flee. There was no time to let the bread rise. They had four cups of wine that they would take throughout the meal uh, because, you know, (laughs) in-laws. Just kidding. (laughs) Sorry about that. Uh, Four cups of wine that they would take throughout the meal, and each cup represented a facet of God's promise back in Exodus chapter 6. The first cup was a cup of sanctification. That's a big Bible word that just means to set apart for a special use. And so this cup represented the fact that God had set them apart as a new nation to be used in his global plan of redemption. And there was a cup of praise representing their response to the good news that God had delivered them from the bondage of slavery. And the third cup was a cup of redemption that that signified God's act of saving them. And then the final cup was a cup of uh, acceptance 
representing that God had declared them to be his people, that they now belonged to him. And then there was the main course of the meal, which was a lamb. And during the night of the Passover, the blood of the lamb is what saved them. The meat of the lamb is what nourished them on their journey to freedom from slavery. Passover was the most significant holiday on the Jewish calendar. And on the night that Paul is talking about, what he's referring to, the night that Jesus ate this meal with his disciples, Jesus takes a nearly 2,000-year-old tradition and he gives it brand new meaning. Now, we can't fully appreciate this because we don't have a 2,000-year-old tradition. Like Thanksgiving is my, maybe the closest. That's like, what, 400 years or something like that. Like we can't fully appreciate what Jesus is doing in this scene as he takes this 2,000-year-old tradition and he completely gives it new meaning. Jesus, as the head of his disciples, the head of the family he had created with his disciples, is responsible for retelling the Passover story. And instead of connecting the bread and the cup back to the Exodus, he takes the bread and the cup and he connects it to his body and to his blood. Instead of connecting it back to the past, he connects it to the future. Jesus is telling them that his suffering, his suffering is going to lead to their ultimate freedom. That the Passover was just this incredible drama that would, that would really foretell what was going to happen when Jesus would come. That his death, his burial, his resurrection would lead to the final exodus. Jesus would be the new Moses leading people out of slavery to sin. He would be the new Passover lamb whose blood would cover us from God's wrath and God's judgment so that it would pass over us. That's what Jesus was doing. And within hours of this meal, Jesus was betrayed, arrested, tried, and crucified. And he would die in our place as a substitute. That through his sacrifice on the cross, justice for sin was served and grace for sin was extended and a new covenant was signed by his blood. That just as the blood of the Passover lamb was applied to the door frames of the Israelites' homes, that the blood of Jesus is applied to us, signifying that we belong to God, that we are his people, he is our God. His death and resurrection were the inauguration of a new covenant, the inauguration of a new people, the inauguration of a new way of relating to God and to each other. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. And while this meal has changed in form over the last 2,000 years, it has not changed in meaning. And it has not changed in significance. It's central to what we do in our service because it is the reason we gather. Friends, we don't gather around a building. We don't gather around a preacher. We don't gather around a program or around a ministry. We gather around a table. Because the Lord's Supper is a picture of the gospel. And for 2,000 years, for nearly 2,000 years, this meal, in whatever form it was delivered, has been bringing the family together week after week. So Jesus held up the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And when he broke the bread, it was symbolic of what would happen to his body, that his flesh was ripped apart from the flogging. The cat of nine tails was intertwined with, with bone, and, and when they would execute that, the bone would dig into the flesh and just rip it apart, oftentimes leaving ribs exposed. Sometimes the wounds were so big, so gaping, that intestines would spill out of the victim. Most victims on their way to be crucified died at the flogging. 
His forehead lacerated by a crown of thorns, his face bloodied and bruised by fists of Roman soldiers, his shoulders shredded from the wood and the weight of the crossbeam, his elbows and his knees skinned and scraped up from falling beneath its weight, his hands and his feet pierced. His body was broken. And hours before it happens, hours before it happens, he says, when you eat this bread, you remember that. And in the moment, they have no context. But after the fact, it all comes into light. It all comes into focus. Jesus says, you remember This sacrifice that I made, you remember that I allowed my body to literally be torn apart from you so that you would no longer be torn apart from your heavenly father. Like my sinless body was broken for you. And then he took a cup of wine and he said, this cup, it's the new covenant of my blood. Blood is life. Blood is life, and when we drink the cup, we remember the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. Like when the blood is drained, when there's no blood, there's no life. And so Jesus bled out, blood poured from his hands and his feet, blood poured from his back, blood poured from his face. The loss of his blood is what gives us life when we come to him by faith. This is not a casual meal. This thing we do week after week, there's nothing casual about it. And the Corinthians were treating it in such a casual manner. And Paul just calls them out. Because this meal is to remember the incredibly high price that Jesus paid for our salvation. And Paul goes on to say, so then, In light of all that drama, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Like, this is a serious deal. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. We've got to take time to think about our life. Before our heavenly father. And he says, for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Because they weren't recognizing the body. They were just having a party. Like we need to come to this meal every week remembering that we don't deserve a seat at the table. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do to secure a seat at the table. In fact, it's just the opposite. Like what I've done, I don't know about you, what I've done should exclude me from the table. I don't even deserve a seat at the kids' table. But this is the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. We don't come to the table by our merit. We come by God's mercy. We don't earn our way there. We are invited to participate. The first table, it included a friend who would betray him three times within the next 12 hours. You know what Jesus did? Washed his feet. It included a friend who would doubt that he was the son of God. You know what Jesus did? Washed his feet. It included a friend who would betray him with a kiss and hand him over to the authorities to be crucified. And do you know what Jesus did? Washed his feet. There were 12 guys around that table. 12 guys sitting around the table 
and not one of them would be there the next day standing around the cross except for John. And Jesus washed all of their feet. And then he broke bread with them. You know why? Because they weren't his enemies. They were his mission. They were his mission. You are his mission. I am his mission. And the invitation to the table is open to everybody. The only requirement for sitting at God's table is accepting the invitation. That you got a RSVP. That you've got to bow a knee to Jesus and come to him by faith. And when we do that, examining ourselves means that we come by faith and we come in humility. If you're not a Jesus follower today, there is, there's no reason for you to take communion. Like If you haven't joined the family, you really shouldn't eat the family meal. But our ultimate goal is for everybody to be part of the family. That's why we do what we do here. Just trying to bring more and more people into the family of the redeemed. More and more people into the family of God. Inviting more and more people to sit at the table with us. All of us. Undeserved. And once you've been born into the family, which is by grace through faith, there is a seat saved for you. And we take our seat knowing that we can't afford it. And just grateful that it's been paid for. And so communion is a weekly opportunity for us to celebrate this truth by sharing a meal with Jesus in the context of community, in the context of family. Just like baptism is a symbol of being reborn, new birth into uh, the family of God, communion is a meal that we share together as the family of God. It connects us. It unifies us. It brings us together together. Uh, with common union. Come union. That's what that means. And in the early church, they broke one loaf of bread and they shared one cup because it symbolized one church. How many of you are all for that? Let's get back to that one cup. We don't even pass trays anymore. Like we've got our own little individual communion packs free of COVID and other nefarious germs, right? And I'll be honest, this bread is a little like styrofoam. <laughs> but it's what we got. But the meaning, it's what I want you to understand. The meaning is still there. We eat this together. As part of our worship together as family. And to eat it, to eat it means to take it in. Like it becomes part of us. Paul said back in, in chapter 10 that when we eat the bread, we are sharing in the body of Christ. And when we drink the blood, we're sharing uh, in the blood of Christ. Or when we drink the cup, we're sharing the blood of Christ. Because blood is life. The reason that, that God required a sacrifice for, for sin was because sin is so heinous to God that it requires the penalty of death. We, we can't fully understand the gravitas of that because we don't fully appreciate the goodness and the holiness of God. And so a lot of that is just lost on us, but we just have to understand that God just can't be in the presence of sin. When he comes to Isaiah, Isaiah stands in his presence and he says, well, it's me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. Like Isaiah is expecting to die in that moment. And we just don't fully appreciate or understand that. But Paul said to the Romans that the wages of sin, what I deserve, what you deserve for our sin is death. That's what we deserve. And when a lamb was sacrificed, the blood was drained out, which resulted in death. It was a substitute. Blood is life and loss of blood is death. And sin required 
death. Somebody had to lose their blood. Somebody had to die. And Jesus became that somebody for us. He came as the perfect lamb. John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus come on the scene, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus became the perfect Lamb who would give up his life by losing his blood and dying as a substitute for us. And the new covenant is that we are saved by grace through faith in him. That when we accept the substitutionary death of Jesus, his blood gives life to us us. And when we drink the cup, it's symbolic of ingesting his blood, which becomes part of us because blood is life. Here's what Jesus says to the religious leaders in John 6, which just blows their mind. So Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Listen, Jesus doesn't just want us to believe in him. Even the demons believe. Jesus wants us to belong to him. He wants us to be part of him. He wants us to be infused in him. And he says, when you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you remain in me and I in you. We are intertwined together. And when we take communion, we're not just remembering his sacrifice. We are participating in his life and proclaiming his death until he comes back again. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough in Egypt for the Passover lamb to be slain and its blood applied to doorposts. That wasn't enough. It had to be eaten. It had to be taken in because it would provide the nourishment for their physical journey out of slavery. And the Lord's Supper is a way of taking in, this little cup and this piece of bread is a way of taking in the life and the death of Jesus that provides nourishment for our spiritual journey out of slavery to sin. Like every week when we do this, we remember that we are no longer slaves. We're no longer bound by sin. Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that you and I have been set free from the law of sin and death. And so we eat a piece of bread that represents his body broken for us. And we drink a a tiny little cup that represents his blood spilled out for us. It's a cup of sanctification to remind us that we've been called out and set apart as the family of God committed to the plan and mission of God. It's a cup of praise that we use to express our gratitude for the good news that we've been delivered from the bondage of sin. It's a cup of redemption representing God's act of saving us, and it's a cup of acceptance reminding us that we belong to God, that He is our Father, that we are His children, that we are family. And when we take it every Sunday, it's a reminder that we belong to one another, that we are brothers and sisters, and that's how Paul closes this out. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, because that's what you're coming together for, not to eat supper, not to eat dinner, not to tailgate. You're coming to eat the body and blood of Jesus. So welcome one another because the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. There is no special room for the rich. 
that Jesus came for all, that Jesus bled for all, that Jesus died for all, and all are welcome to the table. So that's what we're going to do. Right now, we're going to move into this time of communion. We're going to do it just a little bit differently today. I'm going to walk you through some prompts. So just go ahead and take the bread from the top, and just I want you to hold on to it. Don't eat it. Just hold on to it. I'm just going to ask you some questions to help examine ourselves. So just go ahead and close your eyes. If you're watching online, you can participate in this. If you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're still invited to participate in, in what we're doing. I would just ask that you don't take communion. I want to, I want to give you a few minutes to spend time in confession. What do you need to confess to God right now? You're not going to tell him something he doesn't already know. He just wants you to, he, he wants to hear you, you say it. Confession unloads the weight that your heart was never intended to carry. So what is it right now that you need to confess to your heavenly father? Just take a minute or so and spend it in confession. Paul says each man should examine himself. Each woman should examine herself. Where is your life right now out of alignment with the will of God and the mission of God? What's keeping you from living a fully devoted life to Jesus? Like what's holding you back from that? Maybe it's materialism, like stuff's got a hold on your heart. And it's just keeping you from uncommon generosity. Maybe, maybe you're afraid to do something that God's calling you to do because it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. Maybe you're afraid of giving something up that God's calling you to give up because it's going to be uncomfortable and inconvenient. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you're out of sorts with. And when our horizontal relationships are strained, it impacts, it impacts our relationship with God because we are family and family doesn't work without forgiveness. I don't know what it is for you. Paul says we need to examine ourselves. So what needs to be addressed in your life right now? And if you don't know the answer to that, then ask God to reveal that to you because we all have something. We all have something that we need to confront, that we need to examine, that we need to account for. So take just a few minutes and examine yourself. Check your heart before God in humility. Now I just want you to spend a few minutes in praise. 
that you would, that you would take some time to reflect on the body of Jesus, that you would take time to reflect on his blood poured out and that you would give thanks for his sacrifice. Spend just a few minutes in gratitude with the Father. And then when you're ready, you can eat the bread and you can drink the cup.